The Louvre has its Mona Lisa, and the Cluny Museum its Lady and the Unicorn. It is both a mysterious masterpiece and a must-see at this medieval museum located in the heart of Paris. Visitors from all over the world come to contemplate its impressive wall hangings more than three meters high, spread over six tapestries. This majestic work of art is said to represent the five senses, as well as portray a sixth sense, the heart, with the final piece entitled, To My Only Desire. With no known signature or place of fabrication, the Lady and the Unicorn was first acquired in 1882 and has since undergone over a dozen restorations. When the Lady and the Unicorn arrived at Cluny, its lower part was quite damaged. And the curator requested that it should be rewoven. Today, it seems lighter than the rest of the weaving, for no apparent reason. Most visitors ask themselves why, and so do we here at the museum. This Monday, the museum is closed to the public, and the room housing the Lady and the Unicorn is taken over by researchers specializing in materials and color. They have come from Bordeaux, in southwestern France, with ultra-sophisticated measuring devices, such as this hyperspectral camera. By measuring the way in which light waves are reflected by the fibers of the tapestry, the scientists will be able to characterize each color. So we shine halogen lamps on the work, which is thus scanned. For each pixel, we record a reflectance spectrum and it is this spectrum that will characterize the material used. We do that for each and every color, red in this case, but there's also blue. 500 years ago, and then over the course of the various restorations, how did dye makers color the wool and silk fibers? What dyes did they use? Two floors up, Raphael Dujon and her colleagues are hard at work. These restoration artists had a chance to exercise their talents on The Lady and the Unicorn in 2012. The answers provided by ongoing research could be of help to them. Although with experience, we have an eye for identifying past restorations, we can't always see them. It isn't obvious to know where they start and where they stop. Being able to use imagery to detect them is therefore very promising for us. The need for our interventions to be reversible and age well lies at the core of our professional ethics. So does the fact that the work of art should not be damaged, although only time will tell if we made the right choices and what needs to be improved. In the exhibition room, researchers are collecting more data using infrared and X-ray techniques. We are looking at the chemical elements in the restored areas of the tapestry. In the measurement we have just carried out, we can see a list of chemical elements that the instrument was able to detect. Iron, sulfur, as usual, that's wool. The investigation continues in the southwestern French town of Bordeaux at the Archaeoscience Laboratory, where we again meet Pauline Kles. For three months, she has been going through old manuscripts and compiling recipes for dyes. The recipes are quite wide-ranging, and it's up to us to decipher the different processes and the vocabulary, which is hardly customary. An example is this recipe for synthetic red dye, found in a book from 1897. We have 4% alizarin red, 4% sulfuric acid, and 20% sodium sulfate. The percentage actually corresponds to the weight of the fiber to be dyed. That's why calculations are important in the weighing process. Once the recipe has been translated, the ingredients collected, and their proportions identified, Reconstitution can take place in the laboratory. To carry out this process, dye maker Charlotte Marimbert has come especially from Belgium. 
après les jeunes, là, vous allez lancer quoi On lance les oranges 2. A specialist in natural dyeing, she tries to get as close as possible to the protocols of the time. A tough challenge. We can't precisely replicate the gestures, nor the colors. It's impossible, because today's products and workroom conditions are different. It is very difficult to imagine what the quality of the water was at the time. We are not even sure where this tapestry was woven. But we use the same molecules, the same chemical components, which will provide information that we can then cross-reference. After careful weighing of the powdered dyes, the textiles are simultaneously immersed in mixtures. They're mixed with different dosages for 40 minutes in order to absorb the color. The dyer will repeat the operation with the other 50 selected recipes. The next step is to rinse the strips and dry them yellows, reds, purples. These dyed fabrics then pass under the hyperspectral camera. So now that we have recorded one spectrum per sample, we can set up a database. This will enable us to compare these spectra with those obtained from the lady and the unicorn and try to identify them. This is only the beginning of a long process. The objective is to gather all the dyed fabrics into one color chart to identify the materials in the original tapestry and in the many restorations. A gold mine that could be used for thousands of other textile works, such as carpets, clothing, or period costumes. And a way to rediscover the treasures of our heritage in a new light.